Hello, I'm Dr. John Cruz. I hope this has started. I am going to be talking today on can humor help in scientific or medical and mental health writing. And I'm going to start with a technical issue. I am coming to you from rural Hawaii, so I am completely dependent on Elon Musk's Starlink. So whatever we can do to keep in Elon's good graces for the next half hour so this connection doesn't go down. Um, so thoughts, prayers, name your first child X, human sacrifice, whatever keeps Starlink happy, hopefully will keep us going. So I'm going to give a few introductory talk or sentences, and then I'm going to actually do some reading. And I know this is a mediums of writers platform. It's a little strange to me that nobody's been reading anything that's been on Medium. And so, but I will celebrate human stories by reading something I posted a few years ago. Um, what I posted was a response to what another writer on Medium had written. And I have contra contacted that individual and they are fine with my, both my original article mentioning theirs and linking to theirs and my talking today on this. So in the topic of can humor help in scientific and medical writing, what's striking is there's lots of good humor sites on Medium. There's lots of people writing about politics and other areas who use humor. And in the world of scientific writing, medical writing, mental health writing, except where it's people who have a condition writing about their own self, um, humor seems to be largely avoided. And I think we are missing an opportunity by doing that. So there are the humorologists and there are people who study this for a living, divide humor into two basic categories, not that they, there is overlap between the two, but one type of humor is derogatory, making fun of others. I'm not addressing that type of humor, which I don't think has a place in this. But the bigger body of humor is presenting someone with something that's unexpected or coming from two different directions. They have to reconcile it. They have to reframe their thinking. And there is research that shows that that introduction of humor helps prime people for new learning, that they do a better job of learning new material in a situation where there has been joking and smiling and humor used. And there's also evidence that the connection between the person delivering information and the audience is enhanced by the use of humor. So I would argue based on those principles, we should be using humor more often. I should give the caveat that almost all that information is based on humor in the classroom. So someone giving an oral presentation and that may be different than using humor in writing, which from what I can find is much less extensively researched. Um, and I will throw in one other, I was someone who likes etymology and the origins of words. I was hoping that humor and human and humane were coming from the same root. Um, unfortunately, human comes from Greek word, meaning of the earth, distinguishing us as not being gods, whereas humor comes from another different Greek word, meaning moisture, where we got the bodily humors and then went to humor. So I'm going to launch into my story. And then most of our sessions should be question and answer. I had tried to seed it with some potential questions, but they seem to have deleted them. So my article, which appeared in the publication Invisible Ill Illness in July of 2021, was titled, If You Want to Smile, Give a Smile. And the subtitle is, an intrinsic part of these muscle movements is social communication. So, my brow furrowed and the corners of my mouth drooped as I read Amelia's article requesting that people not order her to smile. The words resonated. My mind connected to the thoughts and my face recorded my emotional response. People had frequently told me to smile. Teachers, relatives, strangers on the street would all deliver this directive. Amelia's words captured many of the thoughts and feelings that would bombard me at those moments, that my face was none of their business, that they were being patronizing, intrusive, or triggering, that I didn't want to present the world with a fake social smile just to make them happy. But the psychotherapist and neuroscientist parts of me now provide responses that I didn't have access to as that somber little boy, an unhappy child. I didn't consider myself an unhappy child. I was shy, reflective, and extremely quiet. I spent a lot of time in my thoughts. I rarely initiated conversations. My fifth grade teacher could, and often did, count on me to deliver the correct answer to almost any question she asked. But she was also surprised to discover at the end of the school year that I had braces on my teeth. 
Those clunky, clunky metal bands have been encircling my incisors since second grade. Had I ever opened my mouth wide enough to smile in class, everyone would have, would have seen my braces sparkle. In those years, many people instructed me to smile. I usually dismissed my lack of smiling as an avoidance of the potential pain of stretching my lips across the array of metal in my mouth. A pain both physical and psychic, since in those days, it was common to make fun of those who had to wear braces. But I knew that my silence, my solitude, my somberness went beyond mere orthodontia. I considered myself thoughtful rather than sad or scared or angry or bitter. I realized that I hear the command to smile much less often now. I'm not just talking about during this mask face, hardly ever socializing COVID pandemic. I mean, for the last three or four decades, I think that strangers permit themselves greater license to tell a child and to smile rather than that, say that to an adult male. After all, who knows what an unsmiling man might do? Pull a gun on you? Or worse, barrage you with lies about a stolen election? Better leave the curmudgeons alone. Perhaps I do smile a bit more now, but I know that overall I present a somber, serious face to the world. The fact that fewer people now tell me to change my facial expression supports Amelia's perception that interlopers are being at least somewhat overly familiar, as well as patronizing when they command others to smile. Most of the people who remind me to smile these days are friends and family. Why would anyone want to get involved in my facial expressions? My reaction to the question posed by Amelia isn't a rejection of her feelings or experience. I don't want to replicate the presumptuous, intrusive, awkward, and inappropriate directive of being told to smile by telling her that she needs to eradicate her current responses and replace them with my suggestions. But I do want to face one of the points she made and address it from a different angle. Rather than a rebuttal, I'm offering this as more like a refacial. People want to get involved in their facial expressions because an intrinsic part of these muscle movements is social communication. Your emotions are yours, triggered by cues your brain is responding to, and you are the one feeling your feelings. But the facial expression aspect of your emotion exists to provide information to the world. Humans are social animals. So in a weird way, your smile or lack thereof isn't just your smile. It's a smile for the whole community. Playing peekaboo isn't just an exercise teaching a baby about object permanence. It's an experiment in the reciprocity of smiles, of joy evoking joy in others, just from seeing it and mimicking it. Genuine smiles can be contagious, spreading joy through a social network. Happy groups of people aren't just happy because they have found other people to be happy with. Smiling happy people generate and grow happiness by sharing it. Smiling does doesn't just communicate an emotional state to others, it also serves as a feedback loop to ourselves. When you smile, a genuine smile, you elicit a little happiness in yourself. While not denying the possibility that the command to smile could trigger a wave of negative emotions, I, current, I encourage Amelia, my younger self, and others to train our brains to have a new response. Something along the lines of, that social animal over there is perceiving that I am to some degree unhappy even if they don't know why, and even when their attempts are crude, they're trying to show me that they care about me and that they hope for me to be happier. That might just possibly create a flash of joy or connection, even if you later opt to return to the thoughts and feelings that contributed to your sadness or other negative emotions. Brain networks at play. As a child, while I don't think that I was suffused with negative emotion, I certainly was reflective and ruminative. Neuroplasticity teaches us that the more your brain practices certain behaviors, the stronger the connections within these pathways grow. The more time we spend in, state, in a state, the more easily we slip back into that state. Repetitive, introspective thinking activates the default mode network of the brain. An emerging finding from brain research is that people who are depressed or anxious have overly connected default state networks. Negative rumination serves as practice for us becoming so profoundly mired in our negative thoughts, patterns, that we have trouble escaping by ourselves. We can use this knowledge to hear the plea from another person telling you to smile in a different way. The instruction to smile can be a lifeline, buoying you up by pulling you out of your ruminative default mode network. By engaging in life, by interacting with another human, we switch out of our default mode network and into one of our salience networks. At least temporarily, we are no longer practicing being depressed or anxious. 
we have an in activated uh, introspective default option. My mother, not a particularly jovial individual herself, delighted in the joke, what's the longest word in the English language? Smiles, because there's a mile between the two S's. Well, rather than making an S of ourselves, we make the earth a smaller, more joyous place by sharing smiles. If you don't want to smile, fine, don't smile. But try to hear other people's entreaties as an invitation to join them in a happier world. You might actually like it. And if you want others to smile, don't tell them to smile. Give them a smile. So that's the end of my written statement. I did have some seated question and answers. I'm not seeing them. So I will be taking any question and answers right now. And I'm not sure where they might appear in the chat. Um, so I can't see if anyone's trying to write in right now or if I'm looking in the wrong place. So one of my questions is when can humor, I mean, separate from when, it, again, if it's derogatory, I think humor is inappropriate um, and that doesn't have a place. But the humor, people who write about humor and learning have pointed out that there are at least two other situations where humor can be a distraction. I mean, so three at least. One, if the humor is completely off topic and just irrelevant. You, know, you have, might have a delightful clown as a teacher who's joking about you know, their own home life or current events, but if it doesn't tie in in some way to the topic involved, the research suggests it doesn't enhance learning. Um, so two other ways humor can be disruptive or push things off track. One is if it's too funny, actually. So if you're too funny and people are guffawing or laughing or repeating it to their friend or who didn't hear it all or repeating it to themselves for the next several seconds, then you've lost your audience. And again, that could be happening in a written humor situation as well. And the other place that it can be distracting is if the humor is too obscure or misses the audience. If people know that a joke is made but aren't getting the joke, then they're spending their time puzzling and trying to figure out what was said. And again, that's disruptive rather than conducive to the learning experience. Um, so another question that comes up is there, again, aside from the derogatory type of humor, are there just topics that are too loaded to, to off limits for joking around? And I would argue, you may not like his sense of humor a lot, but that people like Mel Brooks have shown that even the most horrible situations and the Holocaust, Hitler, genocide are, are there. Um, both Mel Brooks and a host of other artists have found ways to use humor to enlighten us, to use the horrors of what went on there, to open people's minds. And some might say it's trivializing, some might be dismissive, but I think, and it may not appeal to everyone, and some subjects are too, maybe too taboo, but humor again is a way that helps us reframe the world and look at things differently. Um, what were the other questions? So I'd written down several questions. I'm not seeing, they, they seem to have been deleted. Um, so why this particular avoidance of humor in the science realm and in medicine and mental health? And I think again, some of it in mental health is that mental health has been so often stigmatized and so often the joking has been of the your inferior or defective kind um, that it's harder space to enter from a the, the the novelty the combining two unexpected ideas of forcing to reframe type of humor. Um, I think in some ways science takes itself too seriously. I think that's part of it. I can remember um, freshman chemistry, we had to do some analysis of oxygen river content and the, the Genesee River in Rochester where they make Genesee beer was frozen over and it, I mean, clearly because it was ice instead of water that affected the oxygen content and how it could be measured in a certain lab. And in my write-up, because we had to explain aberrant results, I've made some snarky comment about Genesee beer and the whether it killed the fish in the river and life forms in the river and whether there's any oxygen content. 
and the um, teacher grading the lab is said, like the rest of what I had to write up, but said, he wrote out, there is no place for levity in science, which I thought was funny enough that I remember to this day, but scientists often take themselves overly seriously. And many of them have delightful sense of humor, um, but even among many of those who do, they think it's important to silo it. And again, I think we have good data that not siloing it, but incorporating it into what we're doing is an effective way of, again, opening minds and communi communicating new ideas. There's, again, in the medical world, again, I, I think for so long, we had a paternalistic model of medicine where doctors were the boss and telling you what to do. And some of that's been upended in the last generation, particularly with the AIDS epidemic and patients taking control of information and decision-making into their own hands rather than relegating it to professionals. Um, but I think, again, doctors are fearful of appearing that they might be derogatory or, or slipping into an inferiorizing type of, meta, of humor if they used um, stance, if they used humor in their approaches. Any other? So the, I guess other topics are, particularly in the written form, when I'm reading, I can arch my eyebrows, I can make silly faces, I can give exaggerated expressions, and, and I'm writing about facial expressions here. But it's been striking. So lots of my articles are filled with dad puns, dad jokes. Um, and so often, I think because people are reading them in a scientific or mental health framework, they're not expecting it, they're not seeing it. Um, one editor who I liked and worked with on several different articles, and in all of them, particularly in the last paragraphs, I tend to put lots of puns and dad jokes. She highlighted one of them and said, was this intentional? And I sort of had to sheepishly say, yes, it was quite intentional and purposeful. This is a joke, and there were actually three or four that you didn't even catch in that last paragraph. So that's the gist of what I have to say. And again, I think there's a way that I should be seeing any questions or answers or eliciting them, but I am not. Seeing anything coming in, I may be looking in the wrong place. So I'll, I'll bring up one other topic. So the book I wrote, which was called Recognizing Adult ADHD, What Donald Trump Can Teach Us About Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. I viewed Donald Trump as a perfect teaching environment. Um, I did use some humor and I think I was trying to use it in a open-ended way and not a derogatory way. Um, I'm aware that he's a toxic and polarizing figure, so that may have also deterred people. But I, I, again, I think we can approach serious topics with respect, with depth, with introspection, with converging of new concepts and ideas without being derogatory, without being demeaning. And hopefully that can broaden us to new audiences So I did, so again, I think some people, many people were deterred from reading my book just by the topic of Donald Trump, but I think others interpreted that if I'm bringing him up in a serious conversation, I must be trying to be derogatory, I must be. With the Trump book, ADHD is an unusual condition in that it's diagnosed completely by objective behavioral symptoms. So whether someone interrupts much more than someone of their age and socioeconomic background should be doing, whether someone's making careless mistakes, whether someone's blurting comments out, whether someone is walking around when it would be appropriate to be sitting down. Um, Mr. Trump clearly objectively far surpasses the criteria for ADHD. So unlike most of our other health, mental health conditions where we need to know what's going on inside his head, the ADHD, he meets the full criteria, and therefore I can say we can objectively talk about him or use him as an example to highlight points about what ADHD 
might be like in other people. Um, so again, I believe that can be used in a non-derogatory way. Again, many people with ADHD didn't want to be associated with Donald Trump. Many people on the political right thought that unless you are praising him as the second coming of MAGA, then that was derogatory and that shouldn't be tolerated. Although several people on the right found that my book humanized him in terms of help them understand the parts of Trump that they didn't like, that some of his abruptness, some of his rambling, some of his going off track, some of his chaos and confusion were manifestations of ADD. And there were people on the left who didn't like the book because they felt rather than completely condemning a man, anything that helped you understand him as a human was a disservice because he should be dissed as a human. So navigating humor can certainly be hard, certainly more difficult in a polarized political environment. Um, I'm still not seeing any questions coming in. But I'm not sure if I'm looking in the right place. Ah, so here's humorous therapy and psychotherapy as well. So at least some people are echoing that and Norman Cousins book probably 70 years ago now, humor is the best medicine. It helped him overcome a severe, potentially disabling and lethal condition. And, and again, in psychotherapy, it has to be used delicately. So it feels like you are laughing with someone rather than laughing at them. So Brian asked how much humor comes in the delivery. So that's an interesting question, both in writing and the verbal format. Some people have, you know, very clowny, buffoony, I'll sort of say the, Rob, the Robin Williams, the zany, ecstatic, everyone knows they're doing something that's humorous. Someone who's a bit drier, someone who has usually more of a deadpan demeanor, it can often be puzzling or confusing when I throw a joke. It's like, did he really make a joke? Was he trying to be funny? What's going on here? So delivery is important. And I think, again, it's even harder on the written page. Again, there are many times, I, I think the majority of what I've written that I thought was humorous, if I had said it out loud or said it in a format like this, people would have caught on that, that there were jokes there and they might not have, or they might not have consciously, but maybe at some other level, some of it penetrated, some of it came through. Um, yeah, so there was a movie, Robin Williams played Patch Adams, who was, I, I don't know if that's, Cornell's referring to a movie, um, and I think it's Robin Williams' movie. I mean, most of Robin Williams' movies use humor in, in effective ways to convey ideas, but Patch Adams is a real life doctor who used clowning as sort of an advoca advocation, brought it into his medical practice to reach people. And he was treating people in what we used to call third world countries and others, but was able to reach them um, through, through using humor. And so, so embedding medics or embedding humor in medicine. Yes, Patch Adams. Um, so Pat, and who has edited some of what I've contributed to the fourth wave, I believe, if I'm remembering the publication right. Um, yeah, so she addresses that, that in addition to ADHD, Mr. Trump is extremely likely to have a host of other psychological issues going on. I won't get into that in any depth. So that makes it, again, particularly difficult discussing him in any format, and particularly if humor is coming into the situation, and, and particularly given that he's so politically polarizing. Any other thoughts or questions or funny jokes anyone's heard today? Or I guess it sounds like you've all renamed your child X or prayed to the right gods because Elon Musk has continued to provide Starlink service for this half hour. Um, so again, my, my book is, I say it's three halves. One is using Donald Trump to explain 
ADHD to people because he's such a vivid in our face example. Um, you don't need to have someone in your life, but, but many people have read it either realize, oh my God, that's describing some aspect of me or my wife, my husband, my coworker, my boss, my kid. So it's using Trump to explain ADHD to people. It's also again using ADHD to explain Trump because if you think he's only a narcissist or only a sociopath, he doesn't make sense is only a narcissist because a narcissist wants you to think that he's a stable, brilliant genius. But if you're doing things constantly that show that you can't keep track of your own thoughts or contradicting what you said a minute ago, or again, he undermines himself so much and the undermining is largely a factor of his ADHD. And then the third part of the third half of the book was about how our whole culture is getting more and more ADD like. So the book came out in 2019, even before the COVID epidemic, but there's things like our changes in how we sleep, changes in how we eat, changes in use of social media, changes in um, probably the video screen component of, of what we're doing with our time and lives are changing all of us. So all of us are becoming a little more ADD-like. And actually, as we become more ADD-like, we engage more in all these changes. So again, I think Elon, I'm one of these people who, I'm well, not really, believes Elon Musk is doing everything to save mankind. And I think his number one project has been destroying Twitter. He's doing a great job of that. And that's probably the best thing for all of mankind he can do. And again, Twitter is a medium that encourages you to you only have a few characters. You're going to have to respond to what's emotional. You have to respond to what's non-nuanced, what's just a skimming of the facts or maybe not even including any facts. But the more we participate in that, the more our own reactions change and our own thinking changes and we have less time to pause and to think and to put it in context and to think rather than just emote and react. So... Our whole world is changing. And as I say, we are all being subjected to a vast uncontrolled experiment where none of us gave written informed consent. We are making our whole world more ADD-like and we are changing all of us are shifting a little bit further in that direction so that some who are on the borderline before are becoming full-blown ADHD individuals. Um, any other questions? I guess there's a Q&A as well as a chat section. So there's both going on. So Dion asked, do you think writers should put humor in the articles featured images to lead with humor? So one of the things that Medium is trying to do is to make sure that our pictures and our titles more closely align with the content. So I think that's a loaded question. So if, if the humor is tied in closely enough that someone gets it and it pulls them into the article, I think that would be great. And if it's more a side comment or a jokey non-related tie-in or pun, then it may be less powerful or useful, but but I often, um, so I wrote an article recently about digital medications and I use the analogy that you have to match digital med medications to the individual that we shouldn't be moving to a world where every pill we take has a sensor in it and is monitoring you. So I used the metaphor of matching that we need a match and I, but I built it a little more extensively throughout the article and, and the picture I used was a, trying to use a match and a picture of a face or a brain or a human to combine the two. It may have been too esoteric. And the title I also used should be, who's, who's a good match for digital medication? There, I think it's used in an integrative way, but I don't know that that got, it's a boosted article and it's gotten many fewer hits than other recent ones. Maybe the title was too obscure. Maybe it needs more time. Um, but I think, again, care has to be taken. But I think if, if it clearly ties in and is intrinsic, I would say, sure, go with it. So Karen asked, would it be offensive to write an essay on everyone today having a label, ADHD, ADD, OCD, 
HSP, you know, autism spectrum. Um, I, I mean, there, there's certainly some of my articles have pushed back against the overuse, um, particularly one that did pretty well on narcissism, overuse of borderline personality disorder, overuse of autism spectrum. I mean, autism spectrum is a particularly interesting one. From a basic science clinical point of view, the whole essence of autism is a difficulty in social communication, not just it's not a desire not to be socially interactive. It's, it's that it's hard to connect. You're not wired quite that way. And to see the proliferation of identity groups joining together as we are all people who can't relate to people. I, I think there's actually an element of humor in that. And I think those groups both attract people who genuinely do fall on a very broad ASD spectrum, autism spectrum disorder, but it also incorporates a mismatch of people with social anxiety, um, other issues that are getting confused, but the ASD label is more popular right now. So I see my time is up, so I will wrap things up. I will be talking in half an hour on plagiarism and writing. So thank you for being here. I enjoyed the talk, it went quickly and I'm on Medium and my book is out there. So have a great and happy day.